okay. So the 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 first thing. Um, so thanks so much for for uh, having me uh, a talk today. It's really fun. What you know, who who says no to talk about something that they love to do and find so freaking interesting, right? I mean, come on, yeah. So um, this picture, I wanted to show you this picture from the outset. Um, I took this picture when I was coming home from Reno, uh, driving back to, to Southern California. I was visiting University of, uh, of, of Nevada at Reno, uh, giving a talk there at the physics department. And um, I knew something, this is before I, fl I started flying, before I started flying gliders. And I had heard of this thing called the Sierra Wave. And there's a, there's a radio station in, in, in the Owens Valley called Sierra Wave. And I stopped to just take this photo because I thought it looked really cool. And um, so now I know a little bit more about what's going on here, and it's just unbelievably iconic. What's this? This uh, what I what I was able to capture here. Um, you can see the the Owens Valley. It's the deepest valley in the 48 states. Uh, there's a 14,000 foot uh, escarpment on either side, and uh, then the valley floor is down at around 4,000 feet. So it's you know 10,000 foot uh, deep valley. Two miles, and uh, what you can see clearly are the beautiful stacked lenticulars, and you see, look at that cork screw rotor cloud below it, and um, it's just exactly what you draw when you teach about wave. There's a rotor cloud underneath the smooth laminar lenticulars. Now the thing that uh, that it struck me when I put this photo up on the for making the slides was that I've flown wave in the Owens Valley a few times. And um, every time I get, uh, this is pretty far north in the Owens Valley up near Bishop. Um, usually I start down at, at Inyokern. And the point is, is that once I get to around Mount Whitney, um, I just get smashed by turbulence. So I'll be up in the, lent up in the lenticular, you know, the, the laminar flow, um, and uh, and then you know down near Inukern and on on the way up to the uh, Sierras, and then by the time I get to Whitney into the bigger mountains, I always get smashed. And what occurs to me when you look at this photo is how high the rotor is here. Look at the rotor; it's like you know, it's 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 twice as high as the as the as the peaks here. So up at twenty thousand feet, I've flown in wave where there's no um, the moisture content's very low. And you can't see any of this. You can't visualize it. There's no cloud. And um, I've experienced uh, incredible turbulence that's just incredibly violent um, in this rotor. And I've experienced, uh, you know, just being rocketed up at 3,000 feet per minute. It's uh, it is a very powerful system that forms in the Sierras, right, and in this Owens Valley. Um, you know, if you read when I started flying and you start hearing people talk about various books to read, you read, there's a book called Exploring the Monster and it details the Sierra Wave Project. And in there, they give all kinds of stories about uh, what happened to some of these guys flying in the 1950s. And, um, you know, some of these people experienced G forces that were, you know, they estimate to be 20 Gs. So there are extreme forces here. Um, we have such great weather forecasting now that now you can avoid the conditions that are too strong. So that's that's something about weather forecasting that you can uh, you can you can take advantage of. Okay, so quick bio on a uh, uh, flying. I am not a very experienced pilot. You guys, you know, probably have so much more experience than me. I I was scared to fly for a long long time, and soaring is what got me out of that mode. And uh, now. There's almost nothing that scares me in the air. Um, you know, I go up very prepared. Um, so you know, I'm cautious about risk. I'm not. I'm not a. a you know, a, you know a, a, a crazy um, wingsuit flying nutcase. I'm more of a really meticulous planner, right? And I do a low temperature physics experiments where these experiments only work. If just everything is perfectly done, you just get nothing unless it's all right. And so for me, uh, preparing for the wave flight was just a matter of spending, you know, little bits of time over a period of a couple of years, just putting together a system where I really tried to think of everything I needed 
and I read about what people experienced and just tried to do everything just right as best I could. So I'm more of a planner and I love to see a plan come to, to fruition. Um, you can see that my, my, my experience is not very high. Um, 300 hours total flying in gliders uh, in, in any flight, um, about 280 flights. I started in 2014. Uh, like I said, I was really scared. And I eventually got over that. And I did my check ride in 2016. I purchased a, a, a ship, a DG-303 uh, in 2017, um, and then started flying in the Owens Valley uh, cross country. And I just read and read and read and tried to figure out how to do this. And I can't tell you how liberating it was that first time. And for, for you younger pilots or less experienced pilots who are still uh, haven't done a cross country flight yet, there's something amazing about hooking that thermal after you got off tow and realizing you can make it to the next landing site and you just go and you just don't look back. And you're not worried about getting to the airport right now. You're worrying about getting to the next thermal, but you know you can make it to the next landing site and you just keep going forward. And on a strong, nice day, all that links together and you can cover hundreds of miles. That's brilliant. How, how fantastic is that? So there's just something fantastic about just getting up high enough and then just not looking back, going forward, just terrific. And like, what's the worst case? You land at that site up ahead, you'll be fine. So it's happened to me, you know, but it's really fun. Okay, so, um, so I just like uh, putting together goals. Um, you know, I got eventually got my diamond badge in 2017. And uh, then I've been starting to think about higher wave flights and what, what's needed to do that. So anyway, um, yeah, the, I have a slide on the Dunn and Kruger effect. And so I think I'm, I think I'm, I don't know whether I'm on top of Mount Stupid or down in the bottom of Mount Stupid. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a second, but that's important to realize. Um, this is the area that I fly in. Um, I don't have a way to make a pointer, but I, I, there's an arrow, a red arrow that shows where Inyokern is. And there's the Owens Valley in the, uh, you can see that um, deep valley. So flying up to, up to Bishop and then crossing over onto the east side, onto the White Mountains. It's just this, it's just this great, great soaring area. So, you know, come fly with us, uh, start at Inyokern and come fly with us sometime. It's amazing. It's a great place to fly. So if you zoom in a little bit more, you can, uh, there's the area around Inyokern. And this is the area that I flew in when I had the wave flight. So I took off at Inyokern and then uh, uh, just, just, you know, within 10 miles north is where all the wave uh, lift uh, was, was uh, concentrated. Here is the airspace. I just, this is, this is actually quite important. Um, the airspace in this area is the restricted airspace for that Edwards controls called R2508. Uh, and um, there's a few of us who fly in this, uh, who fly around this, the Mojave Desert there with gliders, who have a letter of agreement with Edwards so that on a great, on a wave day that's forecast, we could submit to them a re request to fly in the Class A airspace. And you would, you know, you would think that having a military airspace makes it l more restricted, but it actually is great because during the week when they're flying their missions, they steer all the commercial stuff away from here, and um, they will give you access up to as high as you want to go, usually, unless unless there's something something they're doing that you can't do it. But um, you know, when you're flying there, though, you're a sitting duck. You're really slow, and there are very fast things moving around you. So you have to have a transponder and, you know, there are big objects moving around. I heard when I was last year, I was flying and I heard, um, you know, you're, you're, you're with your, you're with your own self for a couple hours and you don't hear much other than the hiss of the glider. And uh, I hear these jet engines and it turned out, I it was like, wait a minute, what is that? Uh, I should pay attention to this. And it turned out it was the, um, over my, over my left shoulder passes an air tanker what seemed to be like, you know, a thousand feet above me, maybe it was 2000, but, uh, and then chasing that air tanker was a B-1 bomber. And then in a few seconds later, I'm looking down the engines of the B-1 bomber. So that shows you how low it was, or, you know, near my flight altitude it was, um, I'm looking down the engines. And so there are big things flying around. Um, the day that I did the wave flight to 36,000 feet, uh, as I was descending, they were warning me about traffic and the traffic was two F-15s chasing an air tanker uh, below me. So it's like, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. 
But anyway, there's all kinds of restricted airspace and you have to be very familiar with what's going on here. Some of the spaces like R2505, uh, you know, they really don't want you in there. They, they are blowing stuff up there, um, shooting things, all kinds of stuff. Uh, you do not want to land anywhere there. Um, but anyway, in the, in, you can get a letter of agreement in this area and they will uh, allow you to fly high. So there's no wave window that we took advantage of. My thinking is, is if in your current turns out to be a place where people want to fly more wave and go to high altitude, Maybe we should establish a wave window right at Inukern. So let's let's just think about that. If that becomes a place you guys want to, you know, uh, come and fly with us sometime, or 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 uh, or where people want to come, that could be something that we could establish. And then we won't have big things, big fast things flying around in that space. Okay. So um, the day, the couple of days before the flight, uh, SkySight was showing wave. Um, you know, the predictions from SkySight are just terrific. So that's what we use for forecasting. There was a few of us that flew that day. Um, uh, uh, Britton Bluedorn, um, Zach uh, Yamuchi, um, and, uh, uh, and one of the pilot, uh, Larry. Um, anyway, so the, the, the predictions were good. We were able to find a tow pilot. Not every tow pilot wants to fly uh, a, a wave tow. The wave toes are, you know, can be pretty violent in the rotor. And, um, you know, I was a huge scaredy cat starting off doing all this kind of stuff. And now it doesn't, it doesn't bother me if the winds at the ridge height are decent, meaning like strong enough for wave, but not moving at 100 miles an hour, meaning at like 10,000 foot ridge uh, near where we are at Inyokern. If the winds are like 40, 50 miles an hour, you know, 40, 50 knots, something like that then it's going to have wave and it's going to be reasonably moder moderate. It's not going to be terrible. If you have something like 100 knots at Mount Whitney, then it's a different story. And I wouldn't attempt to fly in that. So, you know, I look for a modest day, a, day, a day that's moderate. And even on those days, we get bounced around pretty hard in the rotor in the tow. Um, so Jeff Montgomery towed for us that day. It was great. But anyway, you can see uh, just north of Inyokern, there was a, a, a peak at, these are, these are different profiles at 10,000 feet, 16,000 feet, 29,000 feet. And the, the, you can see the wave moving, uh, the peak of the wave moving more towards the mountain escarpment, um, you know, to the west and uh, as you go higher, just like the classic wave does. So that's exactly where I flew. Uh, that was at 9.30. And then the next, um, the next uh, slices I'm showing you, just for your record, you can see it at 11.30, two hours later, it was still there very strong. So I knew I had a window that, at least in the forecast, that looked like a few hours at least of strong, strong wave lift, uh, you know, peaking just north of the field, basically. So I got towed up to about 8,000, I got towed, uh, I encountered the wave something like the field is at 2,500 feet. I encountered the wave um, if around maybe like 7,500 feet, maybe 8,000 feet, somewhere around there. And then I stuck with the tow plane for another 500 feet uh, just because I'm really conservative and I do not want to come back and land and get another tow. So I'm just like, you know, the hell with it. I'm going to stick with this guy for a little bit. And we just ride, raised together. And it was like, okay, I'm clearly in the wave. I'm not going to mess this up. And then, okay, I'm, I'm rising, he's rising, I disconnect, I just keep going up, right? There's no, no, uh, no, uh, uh, you know, no reward for taking the minimum tow to get into the wave or, you know, fighting through the rotor to get back up, which I've done in other instances and it's, it's really no fun. So anyway, so I got connected with the wave and then you just go up. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? <laughs> That's really what it was. Um, the uh, okay, so those were the forecasts. Uh, the other thing I look for on the forecast is the winds on the ground. If the winds on the ground are forecast to be something crazy like thirty knots or something, I'm just not going to go. It's just too it's it's just too hairy. Um, getting the glider out and into the trailer is too hard. You just forget it. There's other days you can go where it's more moderate. So this was a day where the winds on the ground in the morning were quite uh, reasonable, very slow in the morning. Uh, Zach took the first tow in almost zero wind. And then I was all set up for the second tow. And immediately the wind went up to like 20 knots crosswind. 
And so we all had to reposition for another runway to get off the ground. And that's the runway we use for the rest of the day. Um, you can see that the profile of the winds, that's the, the third, the, the third uh, over here. Um, I, don't, I don't see how to make a pointer. Anyway, the third, third image on, uh, from the left there. Um, you can see the profile of the winds, you know, it's just growing as you go up. Um, you know, it's peaking at something like, what is that, 90 knots at, 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 at 30 millibar, which is like 30,000 feet. Um, you can see that the, the red line, the temperature profile, that it's cooling, cooling, cooling until around 30,000 feet. And then it starts to eventually become parallel to the temperature, gray temperature lines there, the ones that are slanted uh, rising towards the right. Those are uh, the, I guess those must be iso isotherms if they're say, all the same temperature. Anyway, that's called, that's the transition to the, if I understand it correctly, to the uh, tropopause. So the troposphere is, is where you have the lapse rate of the, you know, the cooling of the atmosphere as you go up. And eventually there's a, a, a section of the atmosphere where the temperature is fixed. And that's where the transition before you get to the stratosphere. So it looks like the, the tropopause is, is somewhere around 40,000 feet here. Um, and that, is, that changes day to day. I noticed on a wave uh, prediction we had a few days ago um, where that was actually quite higher. So, you know, reading about Bob Harris's flights, I think when he was trying to really do a record flight, uh, he was looking at where that transition is. So, um, yeah, so anyway, the, those are two slices, the skew tees for the day. And you can actually see that there was no cloud. There was cloud, there was a cap cloud on the mountains. There was a little rotor cloud that we got in front of when I got off of tow, but there was no lenticulars. Let's see. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, that's the forecasting. So I just use SkySight, and we all use SkySight. That's what I'm using, just, just to let you know. Um, and now I wanted to just uh, tell you a little bit about oxygen equipment. And um, I put up some, on my website, I have all my notes that I'm putting up about wave flighting. I'm just trying to make a resource of where uh, one can go to learn about all this and, and how to think about it. Um, there's a, a PDF on there called the FAA Intro to Aviation Physiology. And it talks a lot about hypoxia and other effects of uh, going to high altitude. For instance, if you've got gas in your gut, it's gonna come out. So I'm telling you that now, um, high altitude, uh, Yes, it, it's, it's going to come out. It actually can, if you have gas in your stomach and your small intestines, it's a serious problem. Serious problem. It's going to hurt a lot. Um, I had no gas issues on this, on this flight to 36,000 feet. Um, but, you know, it is a, it is a something to be the concern about. You're going from one atmosphere, one bar, to at uh, 36,000 feet, it's 0.22 bar. It's one quarter of the, it's going into a chamber where you've pumped out three quarters of the air. So there's not much air in there. Anyway, this is a slide where you should be uh, well aware of what the deal is, why high altitudes are dangerous. So it's a, it shows you a table of the altitude versus the time of useful, useful consciousness. And I just wanted to tell you something that, something silly that I was, uh, um, when I first started thinking about this, I was always wondering, like, and just maybe you've wondered the same thing. If you hold your breath, if you're really good at holding your breath, you can hold your breath for many minutes, right? And you get really good at it. And you're like, you hold your breath for minutes. But look at this table. This table says at 40,000 feet, you are basically useless after 20 seconds. And you're like, well, what the hell is that? I can hold my breath for like three, four minutes if I get good at if I'm, you know, if I'm good at it. But that, that's a far cry from 20 seconds. The problem is, is that the pressure is so low that when you're holding your breath, you're holding one atmosphere of uh, inside your lungs, and you can still absorb the oxygen that's inside your lungs, and um, you can still you know, get that into your into your blood. Whereas at your 40,000 feet, the pressure is so low that the oxygen diffuses the other way, and so you're actually your circulatory system is just it's it's just the oxygen is just coming out. So unless you have pure oxygen um, right there in your lungs. Um, if you've got nothing, it's going to all come out through your lungs. The, the pressure of oxygen inside your blood is higher than the pressure on, in the atmosphere. It's coming out. That's why you lose it quickly. So anyway, that's uh, don't think you can hold your breath and uh, get away with that. That's not going to work. 
Um, but this is why it's very hazardous. Uh, some people who I respect do not want to do this. Who, who um, uh, you know, this is a risk that you have to carefully consider. So, it, you know, like I, I said, there's a slide I have in here where, um, you know, where you, it's basically saying, uh, let me just go to it now. I'll show you, show you that. Um, yeah, right here. Uh, so this is dangerous. It has possible fatal consequences. You should be well aware of that. Um, high altitudes are an unforgiving environment. And um, you should really think carefully about this, whether or not this is something you really want to do. Um, and the answer to, is this worthwhile? No is a totally respectable answer. I find it interesting. I think the adventure is interesting. Um, this is a higher risk than going on a cross-country flight where you've identified all the landing sites. Um, this is like going on a scuba dive alone. There's no one to help you if something happens. Um, so, you know, I think carefully about this, whether or not this is a worthwhile activity. I think doing this a lot probably is not a good idea. Uh, risk multiplied by many times, eventually something bad can happen. The other thing I, I like this slide is, have you ever heard of the Dun, uh, Dunning-Kruger effect? For the younger students in the, or, you know, younger pilots in this, this is a really great psychological thing. And uh, I see this all the time with our seven-year-old. So the Dunning-Kruger says, it shows you the level of confidence somebody has plotted against how much actual experience or knowledge they actually have. And the point is, is that the curve is very steep at the beginning. It's a steep learning curve. Everyone has always that, they have that, that's a misnomer. Steep learning curves mean you learn fast. So they have a steep learning curve and you learn a lot really quickly and you think that you're really competent, but you actually know very little about the real world about what things can go wrong. And so this is called Mount Stupid. And as you eventually keep going, you realize through mistakes that you actually know very little. And the, the, I like the way they plotted, the, someone wrote, made this, it says almost bends metal. So this is like, you know, an air, if someone landing an airplane and doing a really crappy job. And so this is Mount Stupid. And then through more experience, you actually climb up the real learning curve, right? And that is a very shallow curve. Shallow learning curves are, are very difficult learning curves. And that comes with real experience. And I always ask myself, am I, am I somewhere? I'm probably somewhere on this peak somewhere. And so I, I, I carefully try to think about what I'm doing. So I try to be very, uh, um, you know, uh, um, modest about my claim of knowledge. Anyway, so yeah, think about whether this is worthwhile to do. Because <laughs> if it goes wrong, it's going to go wrong badly. And on my website, uh, you can see, I make a, a, a mention to a flight that happened in, in Hawaii where the, the pilot uh, lost control of his glider at 38,000 feet. And uh, you know the, the, he hit the ground at, at the mountainside at 10,000 feet at, at 300 miles an hour. So anyway, things can go badly and you really should think about this. But if you decide that this is something you want to try to do, these are the, the things you have to think about. Um, this chart, I won't go through this chart in detail, but the point of this chart, if you look at it carefully, I don't have a pointer. Um, I don't have a way to point. So, yeah, so anyway, you can. This, the point of this chart here is that it's, it's basically showing, do you see the um, on the, the right-hand side, the column that's aviolar, uh, um, where is that? Oh yeah, percent oxygen saturation. It's on the right-hand side. So you see at, at sea level, you're at 96%, 5,000 feet, 94. 20,000 feet, 60% saturation of your blood. You're pretty much done there. That's when your body starts really shutting off. So at 20,000 feet without any oxygen, you're in real trouble. Um, but anyway, if you wear a oxygen mask and feed yourself pure oxygen, you can be at 96%. So that's why the mountain high system can work so well. So mountain high, you have just a little mask over your face. You breathe pure oxygen, trying to get most of that into your lungs. And you can stay well saturated, uh, blood saturation uh, up to 28,000 feet. And so I've used that system. It's really convenient, very simple. So anything below 28,000 feet, you can use the mountain high system. Above 28,000 feet, then you have to start thinking about other things. And so this is where this oxygen regulator, the A14, is, is needed. And that's an old World War II technology that's still fabricated. And it's called a diluter demand. So diluter means that it can figure out 
whether to give you pure oxygen or oxygen mixed with air. So they've got the little springs and gears in there to figure that out. It's a demand, which means that you, when you pull a breath, that's when it gives you oxygen. It's just not constantly flowing. So that makes it more efficient. And then it's a pressure breather, which means above 35,000 feet, it starts uh, having a static pressure to, uh, of, to in, of pressure inside your um, lungs of oxygen. And as you go higher, you have to crank a knob to turn that pressure higher and higher. And it's equivalent to, uh, it starts out just as a couple inches of water of pressure. You know, water, one atmosphere is like 34 feet, right? So the first, the first uh, indication of pressure, I remember feeling at around 35,000 feet or so, or 30, 33,000 feet. You can feel like an inch, you feel like your lungs getting filled up a little bit. But eventually that gets to, when you get to the highest altitudes at 45,000 feet, that diluter is, uh, uh, that pressure breathing is gonna be 12 inches of water. And that is very laboring. You have to push, press, push out to get the air out. You have to push out. The oxygen's being forced in your lungs and to exhale, you have to push back out and it's very difficult. And if you read the paper that's linked on my website, uh, from, it's a 1945 research paper about pressure breathing. They talk about when you're up at 45,000 feet and breathing with 12 inches of water, some people have problems with circulation, their heart. This is like, there are serious issues uh, with that kind of pressure breathing. So not everybody can do it safely. Anyway, but at 40,000 feet, the pressure breathing is just a couple inches of water. So a triple Lenny is probably, you know, it's very hazard if something goes wrong, but the actual basic, if things are working correctly, it seems like a reasonable thing. Um, and a double Lenny, 35,000 feet is totally, is totally doable uh, physiologically for a healthy person. This is a chart from that pressure breathing paper. And it's, it, what it's showing you is that uh, the left-hand column is your blood oxygen saturation. And you can see that if you're doing pressure breathing, that's the second column from the right at various altitudes, 38,000 feet, 42, 44, 45, 46, 49. So at 49,000 feet pressure breathing, where uh, Bob Harris was, his oxygenation was probably like 70%. And that's getting quite dangerously low. So I would, you know, I'm skeptical that anybody would ever break his record or should attempt it. It's, it seems quite hazardous, right? Um, so pressure breathing there, you're at 70%. But if you're at 40, if you're at 40,000 feet, you're in the 90% saturation with pressure breathing. Big difference, big difference. That's, that's reasonable. So this, this chart here is quite, is quite important. And they describe this in this paper. The paper is linked on my website if you want to take a look at, read the paper. It's, it's easy, it's quite easily, easy to read. Okay, so yeah, we talked about that. Here's the oxygen circuit that I put together. Um, I have a main bottle that, that's a main, that fits in my glider near my seat. Uh, and it's a 22 cubic foot. And I put a mountain high regulator on that bottle. And the mountain high regulator, the one I have, has a side port for a pressure gauge. So you can just see that, hey, how, fill, how full is the bottle? The bottle, 1,000 PSI, 18, 1,800 PSI, whatever. So I took off that pressure gauge, and that gives me direct access to the high pressure in the bottle, which then I route using some flexible lines to uh, the A14, which is near my right hand when I'm seated in the glider. And along that, along that high pressure line, I can put a gauge and a valve. The gauge is there to tell me how much more oxygen I have. The valve is there to turn off the high pressure oxygen if the A14 were to fail. Like if something, some gasket, you know, you're counting on somebody assembled some little widget in, on a bench that has mass, little springs and gears and little pieces of rubber and you're counting on this to work when you're up there for a couple hours. And so if that thing is somehow screwed up, I wanna be able to turn it off. So that's where the, the valve is there. So anyway, that's the high pressure circuit it goes to the A14. Um, and then the output of the A14 goes to ultimately right to a mask. And the mask has a junction uh, that you, you strap to your parachute called the CRU60. 
And that junction is important because it has a, a, a third port. It has in and out for the A14 for the oxygen, but it also has a, a port to, to feed in a bailout bottle. So the bailout bottle, I, I actually teed in two, two things to there. I, I tee in um, a, a bailout bottle, which is a separate uh, two cubic foot bottle at 1800 PSI, so that if my main bottle failed, I could just switch to this two cubic foot bottle. Okay, so I had a separate container of oxygen that if I saw my gauge start to go to zero for some reason, then I could switch to the bailout bottle. Um, and that gives me something like 15, 20 minutes of oxygen, and you can descend at easily 2,000 feet per minute, maybe 3,000. So that gives you enough time to start getting down to a safe altitude. But you have to react quickly. You have to be watching the gauges. I watch the gauges like a hawk. I watch my blood oxygen like a hawk when I was doing this flight. I'm not sightseeing. When I posted the picture on uh, Facebook, people were like, where's the pictures from outside the glider? I'm like, what, are you guys stupid? I was watching every gauge to make sure that I wasn't going to die doing this, right? OK, I was not taking pictures with my cell phone. So anyway, that's the bailout bottle. The, the, uh, the, I have another fixed flow system that comes off the mountain high uh, uh, regulator. So that, you know, the mountain high regulator has something like a 28 PSI output pressure uh, that went to a small valve and then right to just one of their uh, flow meters, their little fixed impedance, uh, you know, you can dial it in and it's a, just an impedance uh, that you can adjust the flow. So here was my logic. Everything's, if everything's working fine, I have enough oxygen, my blood saturation is fine, I'm using the A14. If, if my blood saturation starts to drop, or then I something's wrong with the uh, the A14. Something's going wrong. I turn the valve to to stop the A14 feed, and I switch to the fixed flow. So it's, then I can then I can pressurize the the I can get uh, oxygen into my mask from the fixed flow, and then descend rapidly. That was my plan. If something happened to the main bottle, like there's a gasket that breaks, then I lose, I lose gas pressure in the main bottle. Then I go to bailout bottle and then I descend rapidly. So those were my, that was my thinking. And I had, I had a Britain Blue Dorn to, uh, who's also done a wave flight to 33,000 feet a couple of years ago to talk to about this uh, oxygen system. But anyway, that was my thinking on what to set up. And as you guys pursue this kind of thinking, I would love to hear what your circuits uh, you, you come up with. If you come up with a better way that you think is safer, that has a better thought process, we should be exchanging information about all this. So that's why I put it up on the website. I want you, I want you guys to see it. And then if you come up with a, a better way or better parts, uh, just let me know. Here's, I disassembled the oxygen system. Um, my glider is about 150 miles away, so I have to put all this together in my lab here at Caltech, and then I bring it to the glider. And uh, it's a, you know, a simple circuit turns out to look like spaghetti when you actually put it together. That's the same for electronics and the same for plumbing. So there's the high, you know, the high pressure main bottle. You can see the A14, uh, the oxygen mask, and all the little parts. So if you just look at that carefully, you can follow the circuit around. It's actually very simple, what's happening there. There's the A14. And then the A14 has a thing called a blinker, which um, there's a port on the A14 on the side you can't see in this picture on the backside, where the, the blinker connects to. And the blinker tells you, every time you draw a breath, those the, the blinker uh, uh, opens and closes. And you can see that the thing is working. So you're sitting there flying sucking on your mask and you can see the blinker and you're like, okay, this thing is working. <laughs> okay, um, there's the A14 Martin. Uh, this was, that was actually a, a surplus A14 that I used as to mock up where to put the, where to put it. Um, and anyway, you can see the A14 mounted on the side of the glider. Um, and then the high pressure hoses, I got those from McMaster car. Um, you know, they're all, I try to use all the same materials to use stainless steel uh, just to avoid thermal contraction issues. So you make things, you know, the, the temperatures that are up at altitude, you can get to minus, I think I was at minus 70 outside the glider uh, at 36,000 feet. 
And so anyway, there's big temperature differences, things that you put together at room temperature and then you change the temperature by 140 degrees Fahrenheit, materials change their shape, right there. So I try to keep sta everything stainless just for that reason. We encounter these problems in the low temperature. I do low temperature physics. We encounter these temp these problems all the time with experiments. So I was kind of attuned to it. Um, like for instance, uh, copper and brass contract more than stainless. So the stainless, this is what we're looking at right here. That that cop that brass fitting is going to shrink inside that, uh, its threads are gonna shrink inside that uh, stainless NPT fitting there. So that's, you know, you wanna try to avoid stuff like that if you can. Uh, there's the, the CRU60, that's the junction between the bailout bottle on the bottom right there. Um, and then the, and I have all the part numbers on my website. So you can, you can find all the part numbers. It took a long time to find some of these things. And then in and out for the um, for the oxygen system. So I used an MBU twenty mask. Uh, it's just a standard modern mask. Uh, I also have an MBU twelve. And um, one thing you have to deal with is the interface of the microscope or the the uh, microphone. So there, that again, that's mentioned on my website. I won't bore bore you with that. When you encounter that, you can just go look at what the parts are that you need. This is the bailout bottle. It's about you know ten inches long. Uh, and I just had it strapped to my leg. I went to a uh, a tailor, a seamstress, to uh, sew some straps onto a flight suit so that I could have this attached to my leg. So, like I said, it's really fun putting all the little pieces together, right? You just you make you putting something together. Um, this is the frost shield that I had, and you can you can't see it so well. I'll try to get a better picture to put up on my website when I get back to the glider. Um, it's, it's, it's a, a 16th inch Lexan and, uh, which is flexible enough that you can spring it inside the glider, inside the canopy, but it's thin enough. You can just cut it with some, uh, some pretty heavy shears. You can cut it pretty easy. And, you know, it, um, I seal it to the canopy using, uh, just some weather stripping. And this is useful to keep the canopy from frosting up. And, um, people who've flown in wave have had issues where their canopy starts to get frosted and they're, they're desperate to try to keep the canopy from becoming, uh, you know, having no visibility. Um, you can also see in the, on the, on my glare shield on the, um, the bottom of the picture, I wish I could point to it uh, for you. There's the, um, there's the UDI that I use that's just resting there. That's usually on my leg. Um, there's a compass. And then there's the blinker. The blinker has the red tube coming out of it. That's the, that I mounted on the glare shield just with a screw, just so I could see the, the A14 working correctly. Okay, um, something else that's important is that uh, VNE, your maximum speed goes down as you go higher. And so you should look to your manual and your glider and figure out what is, uh, what's up with that. And it has to do with the flutter speed of the wing. Uh, the flutter of the wing, the instability causing the wing to flutter. And so in the DG glider, uh, DG manual, it says that you should do a linear extrapolation for, uh, they have the points to 20,000 feet and you should do a linear extrapolation to higher. So that's what I used. And at 36,000 feet, I was flying at one point at 80 knots when I was trying to descend as quickly as possible. And I encountered no flutter, so no, no issues. But you should be cognizant of this as your V and E goes down. Your true airspeed is going, you know, way up, um, but your indicated air speeds are all going to be the same. Like your indicated stall speed is going to be the same as you go up higher. So there's no issue there. But your where you're going, where your indicated airspeed for V and E, that's going to go down. So you have to think about that. Um, so just some thoughts. Uh, I wanted to uh, what. One thing I have I didn't mention much on on the Facebook discussions about all this was that I had one uh, aspect of this flight that caused me a lot of concern while it was happening, and in retrospect, you know, when I it's really interesting and fun to think about after something happens. Like we we do this with experiments in the lab, where you know after we've done something, we ask ourselves, did we do it right? Did we make the right decisions? Did what can we learn from this? You know, were we idiots? Did we? Did we use the information we have correctly? You know, like the kind of a retrospect, like, you know, can we be smarter people, right? Okay, so here's, let me just be honest about a question I have about my own decision-making on this flight. So I just wanna, uh, 
you know, be, we should all be thinking about whether making correct decisions. So here's what happened. At around 30,000 feet, uh, the stick, I know I tried to adjust the trim and the trim became, was totally frozen, would not budge. And then I went to move the stick some and I found the stick very rigid. And then, so, okay, I was really worried momentarily, like, okay, where does this go? Not a good thing. Um, but then I realized that by applying pressure on the stick, I could control the glider. I could control the pitch. I could control, um, you know, rolling left, rolling right, turning left, turning right. Everything's, everything was fine. It was very stiff. The forces needed were big, but I was in control. And I have to say, I sat there for a few minutes thinking what to do. You know, I thought about the temperatures, like what's going on? Is it, is it the thermal contraction of the, of the metal parts? And, you know, the metal contracts at a different rate than the composite structure of the glider. So is some of the control mechanisms binding up due to the relative thermal contraction? Um, when I got to back to the ground and I mentioned this to a couple of people, they were like, oh, it's grease. It's the grease is freezing. And that bunch of people mentioned that independently. So, you know, like I said, I'm a newbie. I always, in this kind of activity, I haven't just, I just haven't done it that long, only five or six years. It's all, you know, I, I try to talk to as many people as possible who are more experienced than me. And so we're gonna focus on the grease to see what the story is with the grease there. So my AMP, uh, Marty Eiler, he, um, he's, he says that what is used in, uh, most gliders is white lithium grease, and that as it ages, it gets dried out and eventually turns to a powder and becomes largely ineffective. And um, so we're going to take apart as much of the control mechanisms as possible that we can access, e access easily, you know, all the parts around the stick and regrease them. And there are, a there are aviation greases that, um, that are good to minus 100 Fahrenheit. And we're going to use, uh, we're considering using this Molly Coat 33, uh, which is an extremely low temperature uh, grease. Um, but then there's mechanisms inside the wing for controlling, you know, the air, air brakes and also the ailerons. You really can't get access to those. So we're going to spray those with Molly Coat D321, which is a, it's a um, friction inhibitor that uh, leaves a coating. Um, it goes down with a solvent and then leaves a coating behind and it's dry. So hopefully that should, um, you know, maybe move some of the white lithium away from some of the joints and leave behind a, a surfaces of metal that are coated with a, um, a low friction surface. But for the joints that we can access, we're going to really use uh, the grease, the Molly Coat 33, which is, is a, it's got lithium in it. It's a silicone grease that's good to minus 100. But like I said, you know, there's lots of details here that matter, right? And I suspect this is the problem, but I also wonder about, um, I wonder about the thermal contractions. And I, and let me just say this, that I've read the crash report for the, the crash at, at, in Hawaii in 2009 with um, David Bigelow, and he was flying a DG400. And he has an unexplained loss of control. And it's easy to suspect that on a high altitude wave flight, it must have been something to do with oxygen, right? Must be something to do with the, the uh, hypoxia. But in the crash report, they, they say that the damage to the glider was so high, they could not rule out uh, possible failure of the control mechanisms. And I can tell you that the forces on the stick were pretty big. And so did he break his stick? I don't know. I mean, I, I wonder. So I reached out to GG about this saying, hey, you know, I encountered this. And, um, you know, can you tell me what grease you use uh, in, back in 96? You know, can you give me, have you anyone ever encountered this? Is this relevant to this other crash? You know, was I lucky? You know, you, you lay in bed and think about this stuff like, you know, what exactly happened here? They have not responded after multiple contacts. And I have to say, I have to say, I find this, you know, they want, um, they want a subscription of, for maintenance for any glider uh, 96 or previous. And I have to say, I, I, I'm not okay with uh, an aviation company not responding to a safety issue. Um, that, uh, that, that is not, 
that's that's not okay. That's not okay. So I'm still trying to figure out what the right uh, right the right thing to do is there. Should there be um, some some report about this kind of issue? I mean, I don't really know what it is. Is it Greece or not? But this is where you know people sharing their experience is important. So the question I have was whether I made the right decision to continue upward. This happened at around thirty thousand feet, and eventually I went to thirty six. So there was a decision to keep going, and I decided to keep going because the I. I thought that the temperature change from 30,000 to 36,000 was not that big. Whatever has happened has largely happened as far as thermal contraction. And um, uh, it, I continually checked it to see if I could, you know, it was the control, was I losing the ability to control? And I, it, it remained the same. So that was my thinking. I would have gone higher. I found five, uh, 500 knots or 500 uh, feet per minute of lift at the very end of the flight. Um, but I was running out of my oxygen tank was running low. And so, you know, everything with oxygen was going just fantastic. The A14 was perfect. It's just like what my PhD advisor told me back at Berkeley. He was like, the complicated stuff that you put all your thought into, that stuff's going to work perfect. What's going to screw you are the little things that you're not thinking about that are actually quite low level. So, you know, I never thought for a minute that the controls would not work correctly. Um, the oxygen system was perfect. That was great. <laughs> anyway, but let me just tell you. So a mistake that I made was that my UDI wasn't quite set up right, where I couldn't quite see where the the it leaves a little snail trail where the the lift is. We'll mark red where the lift is and blue where it's not. And for some reason, it got reset and it wasn't working correctly. But what that ended up doing, I think, wasted around thirty minutes of time that I could have been using for climbing better and finding flying better. So I didn't really fly it as best I could. Um, and that simple mistake of not having the flight computer set up right probably cost me that. The other thing I thought about later in the, after I got back to the ground was, you know, when you have a, a pressure gauge that is based on uh, mechanics, based on just the deflection of a, of a little tube, um, you, you calibrate that, you look, you mark the zero with a pen, let's say when there's zero pressure in the tank, and then you mark the, with a pen, you can mark it where there's 1,000 PSI or 1,800 PSI. Anyway, you can mark these gauges and you can have like, yeah, I have, I've calibrated this. I can see what z where zero is. I want to know where zero is. That's an important thing. Where, where is the empty tank? And the question I have is, does that zero change as you cool from plus 70 degrees down to minus 70 degrees? That's an important thing to know. I didn't really consider that. And so I've, I've recently swapped out the gauge to a gauge that I know is good to minus 65. There are such gauges. The other thing I thought about was that the O-rings that seals the regulator onto the bottle, um, are those actually good to low temperature? It's not something I really thought about. And after I got down from the flight, I was like, wait a minute, that, that O-ring there, if that O-ring fails, my main tank will leak. So I've switched to all fluorosilicon O-rings and those part numbers are on my website. So anyway, those are kind of the details, the nitty gritty details of, uh, of how to think about this. And, you know, some of the parts that I hope you guys can use if, you know, for your flights and, um, and that we all can share about the techniques. Last thing I wanted to say uh, about all this was that, you know, a, a double any flight like this is it takes an entire community to do it. You can't just go do it by yourself. And there's a whole chain of people that made this possible. In the day that we flew, um, you know, one of the guys, guys from uh, the Inyo Kern Club, the Southern, uh, the Sierra Soaring Club, you know, came out and just did ground support just to help us get launched. And it's just like, I mean, then there's tow pilots and the whole deal. It takes a bunch of people. So, you know, there's one person that gets the little pin, but there's a lot of people that go together to make all this happen. Um, here, there's a website I put up where you can see all these wave notes. So anyway, that's uh, that's kind of that's kind of the nitty gritty uh, technical stuff, um, and like I said, my website has all the parts and things that you can just read about uh, what I used, and hopefully that saves you a lot of time. So anyway, yeah, hopefully that was not terribly boring. <laughs> that was awesome. How long <laughs> was the flight? Yeah, the flight was three hours. I think I wasted probably. 20, 25 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, uh, just mucking around it downwind of the wave. 
And then once I figured out where I should be, I rocketed up the last, you know, so here, here it's classic. It's like, you're flying, you're flying, you're climbing, you're climbing. You're like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And then at, I need to get the 35,000 feet for the little pin, right? I want to get the pin. It's a double any pin. And at 34, five, I'm just topping out. I'm like, oh man, what is going on here? And uh, so then I start looking around and I'm not finding anything. And I'm like, okay, one last mad dash. I head towards the mountain. And of course, that's where all the lift is. As you go higher, you should go towards the escarpment. And I just found the lift and I just got picked up and just carried up another 1500 feet or whatever. And like I said, if I would have had more oxygen, I just would have, I would have touched 40, I think. The day was strong, but not outrageous. It wasn't, it didn't seem dangerously strong, but uh, it was really going up strong when I was, when I decided to turn back. Yeah. And then I came down, uh, I got very cold on the way down. Just, oh yeah, so just so you know, the way up, I was fine. I was flying relatively slow and the, the air leaking in the glider wasn't terrible. But on the way down, when I pulled out the air brakes and really started speeding up to go down, I got really cold. I mean, like shiver, full body shiver cold. And that's happened to me before on these wave flights as well. I get cold on the way down. I think there's so much air leaking in that's washing over you and it's very, very cold air. Um, so I stopped at 15,000 feet and just warmed myself up again. So, hey, Keith, uh, What's that? Keith uh, Kelly here. Yeah. I had, I had a question. Uh, so the winds were st quite strong when you're up there. Were you thinking that, how, how strong were they? They uh, 80 knots or? Yeah, something like 80 knots, 80, 90 knots. Yeah, we were really strong. I had a so, 200, 200, knot, 200 knot ground speed when I turned downwind one time. Right. So <laughs> so when you find your founders trying to you know stay in the way, you're obviously facing west and yeah and um and you're looking at your gps or you're looking at the ground to keep your your position so you didn't get blown backwards and my other question is you know if you got an 80 knot headwind and you need to move forward well then you're going to be past your v and e speed right i mean yeah you're, you're, right well, that, that I mean, 80, the, 80 knots, the 80 knots is true the true airspeed you're the the v and e is your indicated and at that altitude, there's like a factor of almost, is it a factor of two between your, your indicated and your, um, and the true airspeed? It's, it's a big difference. So at 80 knots uh, indicated, you're moving at, you know, 120 something, um, you know, true airspeed. So you're actually moving quite, quite, quite a bit faster. So you are, it is, it is possible to make progress upwind uh, in that, in that kind of headwind. But like I said, I didn't have my computer quite set up right. I wasn't quite prepared for the computer and I didn't quite fly it correctly. You know, the, the dream wave flight is you're flying these beautiful figure eights. You're, you're crabbing into the wind, keeping yourself over the wave and just going back and forth like that. I, if you look at my trace, it's just kind of like, I don't know, it's just, it, it looks like a madman flying up there. So, <laughs> I've seen traces from like, you know, from Steve Fawcett and Einer and those guys doing their flights and they, you know, they look perfect and stuff. Um, I was just kind of bumbling around trying to figure out where I should be. I made the mistake as well of look, trying to look to the ground to, to figure out where I was like get, but your perspective is so wrong when you're up so high um, that it, I wasn't, I wasn't maintaining my position very well. So next time I'll be, I'll have a better, uh, I'll use the GPS, the flight computer to show me where I am a little bit better. You know, I was more, I was more focused on my life support given this was my first flight above 28,000 feet. I was really focused on how my body was doing. I just was looking at any indication that something was wrong. So now that I know the oxygen system seems to work pretty well, and it's I also that you can breathe, the pressure breathing is is not so terrible. I thought I, I didn't think I, I didn't know if I would like it. Like it would, you can kind of you can psychologically get yourself into weird places where you can get um, uh, oxygen hungry, where you breathe a lot, you know, and um, you can try your body out and your own psychology and in a oxygen chamber. Uh, they have one at Arizona State. Uh, in Phoenix. And I, I took a ride there in one and you wear a mask and they pump out the chamber down to 25,000 feet and you can try it out. I didn't know if I would like this. And so I was, I was wary of whether or not this was going to work at all. And I was ready to bail out because I'm just, me, not jump out of the airplane, but like descend. 
if things don't look right, this is, you know, this is just not worth it. But it was fine. You just sit there, you breathe. It was great. Watching the, the, uh, the, my blood saturation, it was fine. But yeah, I could have flown it a lot better. Are you planning on doing it some more? I'd like to. I, I want to fix the grease issue first before I ever go back to that kind of low temperature. Like I said, I question my decision making. You know, there's a strong there's a strong decision that should have been as soon as the stick didn't feel right just to descend. That's a reason. That's a reasonable decision to make. Um, so I think the smart thing to do is the reasonable thing to do is to make an attempt to fix the grease and go try it out again. And if it's you know, it, Keith, I bet you DG uh, gliders. You know, you're posing a question to him and saying, you know, at minus uh, seventy degrees Fahrenheit, it, <laughs> and should I expect some kind of control problems? I'm sure they're looking at each other and going, hell, we don't know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> How yeah. Would yeah know no, that? How would we know that? Well, it, you know? yeah, I, and that's totally reasonable. It's totally reasonable. And you would expect an answer. You'd expect an email return, you know? Yeah. That answer, or you'd expect an email that might say, we considered this with Bigelow's flight for this reason or that reason, we think yes or no. Information yeah. is important. Well, and and like I said, there's so much more experience in the world out there than what I have that it's uh, just, just, uh, just sharing some would be really helpful. But anyway, I, I got down to 15,000 feet, waited there. We, I checked the winds on the ground and then executed a, a really crappy landing uh, to celebrate a great flight. <laughs> so, <laughs> that part I don't show. <laughs> great. Yeah. But you know, the A14 is the, is the key to go above 28,000 feet. Um, and I had a new one built. You can, you can find them on rebuilt or you can find the old ones, but the fluid power, fluid power is very reluctant to rebuild uh, some of these old ones. So just getting a new one um, built, it's 1800 bucks, it's expensive, but if a club had a one or two of them to share, I, you know, in the end, they're relatively simple devices. They're just springs and, and uh, you know, bellows in there. So they're relatively simple. I think if people were careful with how they handled them, they could be shared. That being said, I would not share mine with anybody. <laughs> 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 yeah, but they're just so expensive. Yeah. So Keith, I can tell that your your background as a physicist has probably made you a better glider pilot and, and certainly helped you in the planning phase. So you've got three hour, 300 hours of flight time. How much time have you put into all the research and reading and prototyping of the life support and uh, high altitude systems that you've developed? Well, I, I, I had a lot of time, you know, my job gives me, I can, I can have time to think about stuff and actually put things together. I didn't do a lot of mock-ups uh, like a, you know, a Mark one, Mark two, Mark three. I pretty much thought about what circuit I wanted, what I thought would be the safest and just put it together slowly with parts. Um, I mocked it up here at the lab and made sure that everything was leak tight and then brought it out to the field. Um, I did some fitting out there just to make sure geometry worked correctly. But the, 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 the experience as an experimental physicist is just really helpful for, you know, like how you put together a system that's carefully done. But, you know, that's, that's, uh, we all have that knowledge if you're an engineer or various types of people who make things that are for unforgiving environments, everything has to work. There's no extra parts, right? So, yeah, but it certainly doesn't help with the flying. I, you know, my, my friends at the field can tell you that. It's like no, no knowledge of Bernoulli's law are apparently helping me execute decent landings. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the equipment stuff is just, I take really seriously the thought about how to actually do this, so. Did you notice any, uh, this is Mark, uh, did you notice any, uh, uh, I don't know, exterior uh, damage? No, uh, none at all. Like, like, do you have mylar seals over your gaps or anything that like that all stayed on? And Everything stayed on. Um, I looked at the glide. So I was ready for that this was going to be an expensive flight. I was ready for that possibility because everyone talks about the gel coat cracking. 
I was just like, fuck it. You should, you should use stuff. You should do stuff with stuff. Stuff is meant to be used. It's not meant to be, you know, whatever. I'm not right. abused, but it's, I want to, I want to do things with things. Um, right. So I looked over the glider carefully before uh, that day with this thought in mind, like, okay, what is this going to look like when we're done? And then I came back from the flight and it looked exactly the same. I didn't see any more, uh, any more cracks in the gel coat. There are, the, the, the DG gel coat is pretty good from what I understand. And there are cracks that are common from like the uh, spoiler boxes. Um, and those were there and they, they were, you know, I didn't see anything extra. So it was fine in the end. Yeah, I was prepared for uh, badness. <laughs> but yeah, what do you do? Yeah, the flying, the flying was relatively benign. Um, the turbulence wasn't terrible on the way down. Um, and then the wave was really gentle. And just finding the strong part of the wave was the only, only, only thing I was doing not quite, not quite right, I think. So uh, Keith, this is Kelly again. Yeah. So tip, typically when you uh, get into the wave there, you fly, uh, you take a tow uh, through the rotor so yes. you're already you're starting uh, you're starting downwind from the wave, and you have yes. to fly uh, penetrate it to get into the wave. Yes, is that how it works. Yes, it is. It is, and it's you know it's dicey. You know, especially the the beginning parts of the tow, um, exactly how turbulent near the ground it is, and whether there's any you know really sinking air right there at the at the beginnings. Um, everything was fine, and we got off the ground fine. Um, and then, uh, it was just, uh, it's a moderate turbulent tow. So, you know, you, it's challenging to stay behind the tow plane, but there's nothing crazy as like, if you read some of the, uh, accounts from Minden where people will say, stay on tow, unless you're in front of the tow plane or you're inverted. Okay. When you hear that, you're like, this is crazy. I don't want anything to do with that kind of flying. This was nothing close to that. This was just a very, very, you know, bumpy toe trying to find uh, the toe plane. Um, that's yeah, it wasn't it wasn't horrible, but I think it has a lot to do with the strength of the wave there. Um, if the wind speeds were significantly higher, it would probably be horrible. So I'm I there you know I'm not I'm I do this for myself. Like there was. <laughs> The the a picture I put up on the gliding uh, Facebook page, you know, it then there was uh, it's it's fun to share and to talk about that that hey, this is how you do stuff and this is you know this is fun to do and maybe there's other people who want to do this as well. That's really cool, but then it got picked up by Instagram and there's like five thousand likes or something and the guy who runs the Instagram page is like, do you have an Instagram page? This thing will go viral. And it's like who the who the hell cares about that, you know. I do all this stuff for, for my own interest and I find it just, you know, for my own satisfaction. So, yeah. Any of the youth members have uh, anything to ask? Nothing, perfectly clear. <laughs> hey Keith, this is Vince. I'm curious, have you, uh, given your passion for this, have you ever considered getting involved with the Perlin project? Yeah, I, you know, I've chatted a bit through email with Jim Payne about um, just uh, some details I've had, but I've never gotten involved with, with uh, the Perlin guys. I saw what I saw there, the, 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 the glider when I was at wave camp uh, a couple years ago, and it was just amazing. I find these guys just heroic, you know, I like, you know, yeah, I really admire uh, this kind of, uh, this kind of adventure. Um, so yeah, I've never gotten involved with it. I mostly just, like I said, it's just, it's just something for, for myself. I just find, I, I read the books, uh, Exploring the Monster, you know, this book. Um, it, 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 it's a Sierra Wave, about the Sierra Wave project. And you just hear what people were able to do. And um, one of the people that was in that, that's mentioned in that book is Paul McCready. He was, a, he was an early wave pilot uh, at the at at Bishop in post World War II, right after World War II, and he was a professor here at Caltech and was the guy who did the human powered 
uh, airplane that crossed the, the English Channel. And, you know, he's just one of these amazing human beings. And um, you read about these people and they're like, you know, they did all this great stuff in the 1950s, getting up over 40,000 feet. Part of it, part of the thinking about like, you know, there's, you got to recognize the hazard of what you're doing. Like it's, it's hazardous. People have gotten killed doing this. So you got to be very careful. But the other part of it is like, listen, people after World War II were doing this. And they were, you know, it's it's dangerous, but it is possible to, to do this. And like with our modern equipment and techniques and, you know, all the little parts that we can get very easily now, we should be able to do this. Like this should be readily done. So that anyway, they're, they were kind of inspiration, the, the early wave, uh, Sierra wave guys. So Keith, uh, how, did you, had you had any flying experience before you start flying gliders? No. Only commercial, and it was I, I ended up having some bad experiences that terrified me of flying. And uh, what got me hooked, what got me started in soaring was I was hiking on our local mountains here, Mount Baldy. It's like a 10,000 foot peak here in uh, Southern California. And a, a glider from Crystal swooped the mountain. And I was just like, this is amazing. How did the hell they do that? And so I contacted them and was like, I should at least go for a ride. And uh, I, I drove there. I had, a, I had a ride, it would turn out to be a wave day at Crystal, they, we just floated up to 14,000 feet and I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe this unpowered vehicle can just get up to 14,000 feet. And I got down to the ground and I was talking to Dale Masters. Dale is, uh, writes that column for Soaring Magazine. Dale's been soaring his whole life. He's super smart, super interesting. Uh, I talked to a bunch of the other guys there in the clubhouse. They're all like engineers, mathematicians, and also interested in kind of this adventure. And I was like, oh, I see, these are my people. And so I immediately started lessons. And um, I, as I've gotten to know more soaring pilots, I realized that this is the, these are the, these are really great guys. And, you know, in physics, there's a lot of people who are interested in kind of, you know, kind of solo adventure, like um, rock climbing, mountain climbing, these sorts of things, you know, uh, managing risk and hazard, but then being able to accomplish some goal that you set off. And so it just seemed to be just perfect. So I got over being scared of it very, uh, it, you know, took a few months of flying and then I was like, okay, this is fine. This, these machines are fine. So Dale Masters had a really funny story. And since we're recording this, let's, let's put this into the archive. So my first couple months of, of flying, I was started in the wind. It started in the late fall, and so I, I, my, a lot of my training was through the winter, and we get these winter storms blowing through from the Pacific, you know, through through LA and then over over the San Gabriels, and I was out there for my lesson, and you know there was a cap cloud coming over the San Gabriels, and really high winds, crosswinds across the runway, and uh, you know Dale's like, yeah, we can we can go up, you know, it's difficult, you have to know what you're doing, but we can do it. So we get towed up, it's really turbulent. I can barely follow the tow plane. Um, and we're, we're get to the mountain, we get off the tow, you know, it's just crazy. We're somehow staying aloft and we're kind of surfing on these big bumps of, of whatever is keeping us up. And it was just horribleness, like just like being thrashed around in the ocean waves, it felt like that. And after about 30 minutes of that, I was like, Dale, I'm done. This is, this is, this is enough, let's, get, let's go. So we go back and land. And I drive home and I drive through the mountains where I can't uh, get a cell, cell phone and uh, connection. And uh, Dale had called me. So when I got back to Pasadena, there's a message from Dale. And Dale says, uh, hey, Keith, you know, really sorry about the flight. That uh, probably was more than you uh, uh, wanted or more than you uh, bargained for. And uh, he says, but a year from now, you're really gonna, you're just gonna think that's the best thing ever. That's just like, you know, fun and exciting and just like throwing yourself in the waves. And then he says something that is great. He was like, it's kind of like an, a young guy looking into an old guy's dirty magazine collection. He's like, there are things in there you're not gonna get. <laughs> he says, but eventually you will. <laughs> I was like, Dale, what are you talking about? <laughs> so anyway, it's just such a great yeah. analogy. I just thought it was really funny. So. Anyway, if Dale Masters ever hears this, uh, Dale, that that is a funny story. So, yeah, I got over being scared pretty quickly. <laughs> what about you guys? What are your plans? Well, I don't know, uh, Mark. What's the plans? Mark Mark decided to uh, keep the uh, club uh, insured, and so they could fly during the winter, which is the first time we've done that. 
And, uh, you know, the weather's not really super good up here in the Northwest, but he's been having some good flights. I'm so, uh, I'm so proud of uh, the people that are actually still flying. It's, it's awesome. So you guys have had these uh, wave flights at Mount Hood, right? Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. Gary Boggs uh, has been posting pictures or linking to them on Facebook that I see him there. Yes. Yeah, Gary, uh, you know, he was a fixture at our, uh, at our airport for many years. And uh, that's who I actually, he was sort of my mentor uh -huh. uh, when I first started flying here. And then, then he left and, uh, you know, we started a club about, what, five years ago now, guys? Is that what it was? Yeah, five years ago. I see. That's fantastic. And there's, we got, a wave uh, window, yeah. there's a wave window south, uh, just south of Hood. And, um, but, uh, uh, and, you know, I was looking at some flights. There's a German guy, uh, Rolf Kohlenkamp, over, uh, he lives over on the other side of Portland in Hillsboro. And uh, he's done some crazy wave flights from here all the way down to Jefferson and past Bend and then all the way back up over to close to Adams. And, yeah, that's uh, because he's a physics professor. That's why. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> better to do <laughs> <laughs> the, you know they operate on different rules than the rest of us do <laughs> you know but we also get uh we also have less dramatic wave uh all over the place here uh -huh. from other uh, smaller um, uh hills and mountains yes you know in in uh paul mccready his uh in exploring the monster they there were some interviews with him where reporters when he was flying out of bishop and his plan was to <laughs> his plan was to take off from Bishop and end up on the other side of the Rockies, um, flying, getting the various wave uh, that you can get off all the as the as you head as you head towards the east. I mean, that's what one of, one of my friends here at Caltech, Michael Marshall, he was just like, yeah, that's what you should do. You need to do uh, straight out from 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 thirty five thousand feet straight out downwind. See how far you can get. <laughs> Make it to you. It's a great idea, isn't it? It is a very good idea. So the problem is I don't have a power license. I don't have an instrument rating. This would be a longer term project, but it's a good idea, right? <laughs> I think some guys did that once. They ended up in like in Wyoming somewhere, yeah. close to the K Kansas border or something. You know, it was like. It went a long ways. Yeah, that sounds like huge fun. I'm 52, so I've got I've got I got some time to, to try these adventures. <laughs> but I'm not like a, some of these guys are like you know 25, like Michael Marshall or whatever. I mean, they've got decades in front of them to try these kind of adventures. I've got to think carefully about what I want to put the effort in. Yeah. Well, that sounds cool. If any guys ever need any uh, any any technical info or whatever, just uh, I try to put everything up online just so that people can peruse it. But just email me anytime. All right, Keith. Uh, congratulations on the double, Lenny. Hang on, wait, wait for this. This is what it's all about. There we go. Double Lenny, number one. All right. Yes. <laughs> yes. The last I think the the last one was two thousand five. So there we go. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Yeah, that's why it's exciting to try to build some community to, to get these going, right? Yes. Let's do it. Yes. So maybe uh, maybe it's a good wave window at Inyokern is um, it's a good thing to think about. If you go back to the slides of with the, with the map and the train, there's like a funnel there. There's a canyon, you know, the big right behind our, our, our the, the south end of the Sierras, there's just kind of this funnel. And then there's about a 9,000 foot, 10,000 foot um, uh, mountain range right there. So it's, it's a really good wave site. Yeah, I think we get, uh, we get more than our fair share of, of wave, but usually, you know, it, it, it peters out around 14. Sometimes we get up higher, we, you know, but uh, it's not super strong. Usually it's, you know, three, four knots. Um, you know, and, uh, but it's, we, we actually hook into it from a ridge. We don't huh. go into it. Okay. We, we fly a ridge that's three miles from the airport. It's only a 2000 foot tow. 
And then from there, we, uh, it, we, we try to figure it out from there. And it's kind of made a sport out of doing that. And, so, um, so, so, so from that ridge, then you can get over to Mount Hood? Is that if the if things are going right, you can follow that ridge clear over to the 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 downwind side of Mount Hood, and and hook into the if things are working correctly, you can hook into the wave in that area to get uh, into the primary wave behind Mount Hood and mm -hmm. get high. So, um, but sometimes you have to hook into some secondary wave that's uh, you know in the area to get over there. It's it's a big mental you know. Yeah. fun every time you go flying you know sometimes you, it happens sometimes it doesn't but it's, yeah. it's always rewarding yeah it's yeah trying to figure to that out yeah that's great that's great the, the last flight i did uh, Jan uh january 3rd here uh i couldn't get very i couldn't get really higher than uh than 10 and uh i kind of had to dart into parkdale around uh so i crossed middle mountain around uh oh around four and uh got out over there's this big uh lava flow and usually if you can kind of get over to it uh you you'll hook into the wave and and i did and it was real interesting i i, I really kind of felt like i was on uh the north side of the bow wave and i could kind of only go you know, if I went too close towards the mountain, I started falling off. And if I went too far away from the mountain, I fell off. And the closer I got, that got more and more defined. And I was like, man, I'm definitely on the bow wave of this. And I climbed that up to, I think I, maybe I did get up to 12. But I was also a little bit more interested in trying to make some OLC runs that day. So I kept darting <laughs> over to, uh, <laughs> I kept darting over to the north side of the river waiting for it to open up to try to go to up to Mount Adams, but it never opened up on that side. So that's right. It's all about the OLC points. No, it's <laughs> no, no, it's really funny. Cause like, you know, when I started off doing this uh, and you start flying in the, uh, in the, in the Sierras, for instance, they're just epic. They're so beautiful. And like, I would leave from Inukern and get over to Mount Whitney. It's about 60 miles North. And uh, I'd just be like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. This is like fantastic. You come back and then, you know, whatever on the OLC, that's, that's nothing. And then a couple of years later, I would go out and fly unless I got 500 kilometers or 600 kilometers, it was a failed day. And I, I would come back feeling <laughs> like, oh, I completely screwed this up. And I'm just telling you, I remember driving home one night and I'm just thinking, I have missed the boat on what I'm doing here. The, you know, the OLC is really fun, but like, you know, this little pin is about 35,000. And if you get 34,999, you don't get the freaking pin. Who cares? So the numbers, I find the numbers of soaring, the obsession with the numbers and the, especially the OLC and stuff like that, it can really, you can really distort what we, why we're doing what we're doing. And I remember, I talked to one of our, another pilot who's about my age and he was feeling exactly the same thing. So mm -hmm. I, I, I love the OLC, it's really fun. It's like, it's, it's fun to have a goal and all that stuff, but oh my gosh, I feel like uh, it can do what social media does to you where you're, you're like, unless I do something that is amazing, it's just, uh, I've done nothing. I have a video, I have a video on, the, on my website where it's this really beautiful video of coming back to Mount Whitney over the Sierras, it's, a, it's about like a three minute video, coming back over the Sierras late afternoon. And I had that, uh, that GoPro, I put on the tail last summer, the first time. And when I was flying that- How do you have that attached? What's that? How do you have that GoPro attached? Is that just uh, a standard GoPro attached? Yeah, Tom, well, Tom Sarkowski told me to um, use a gaffer's tape on the surface. And so right. I, I attached the GoPro onto a standard adhesive mount, onto okay. a thin piece of Lexan, like a 16th inch thick, so it's kind of flexible, like a square about like four inches on a side. Yeah. So the GoPro is attached to this little square of Lexan, and the Lexan is then taped onto the tail. And it's, it's flexible, so it can be kind of conformal. Gotcha. And just just gaffer's tape is sticky enough to do the adhesion and also doesn't leave any residue and damage the surface. 
anyway, I just wanted to say that. Okay, so I got this amazing video. I took I took this I took this GoPro, and uh, I put it on the tail, and um, I was flying back uh, from a flight where it was the it was the furthest north I've ever been up up to like Mono Lake, and I was trying to make this big loop over to Boundary Peak on which is on the White Mountains. And I nearly landed at Bishop because I got washed off the mountains with uh, a rainstorm. And I made some bad choices, right? We all make bad choices. I made some bad choices and I nearly had to, nearly had to land. And I dug it out. I dug out, you know, I actually had my wheel down. I was going to land and I found a thermal right at the airport. And I, it was a 10 knot thermal. It was like some gift from God and just, just climbed right up and then eventually got back onto the Sierras. And I was miffed. I was miffed that I but that I screwed up my 700k plan, and I turned on the GoPro and I flew flew back, and then when I eventually got uh, home a couple of days later, I looked at the video on the GoPro, and it's absolutely gorgeous, and it's epic, and I remember thinking my mental state during the flight at that point was like how I had screwed everything up, and I completely missed how absolutely beautiful this flight was, while I was doing it. And it's just like these these silly uh, OLC things. So, so anyway, the last flight of the season where I knew I had my last flight, I was just like, you know what? I'm going to go out and enjoy. And I just flew along the Sierras. I got over to Boundary Peak. I had this great day. And I gave zero fucks about what the score was. So there you go. There's something important in all that. <laughs> I agree, Keith. It's all right, uh, you know. The fact that you're up there defying gravity is just still amazes me that you can uh, go and spend three or four hours of total fun and uh, you just did it through your knowledge of what you think is going on in the atmosphere. It's, a, it's an amazing sport, you know? It's amazing. Thousand pounds of stuff floating around in the air. Oh, I know, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree. I, my, own, my own mind is, always gravitates towards numerical metrics of things. And it's a it's it can be a poisonous uh, way of thinking. That's why I'm trying to trying to free myself from that kind of thinking. So right there, on, right on. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a carpenter. What the hell? I don't know anything. I just you know, I live by the moment. Yeah, we all know yeah. stuff. We know stuff, right? We just know stuff. Yeah, just different stuff. Different stuff. Yeah, well. Anyway, I gotta I gotta get home at some point. Did anybody have any any other questions they want to talk about? Or I'd love to come fly with you guys sometime in uh, Mount Hood. That sounds like gorgeous. Yeah, I'd like to go down where you're at. Uh, oh, come and visit us at Inukern. That is a great cross cross country site in the summer. Let me tell you, because the beauty of the beauty of Inukern over to Hatchapi, and if any of those guys are listening to this, you know I I love them, but they have an inferior site. The problem with Tehachapi is that it's often difficult to get back. In your Kern, it is really easy to get back. So you can go have this epic day in the Sierras and on the Whites and the Inyos, which are just unbelievable. And the chances of having a land out and retrieve is low. So you're going to get home. And if you don't have a crew, who flies with a crew these days? Very few, few people. So it's really great. In your Kern's a great spot. So if you guys ever want a safari, um, I'm in your current. Hmm. It's a, you have a tow plane out there, obviously. I mean, it's a yep. full. Yep. We get, there's a club. Cool. It's a, it, and you know, usually it's when we fly cross country in the summers, it's like four or five of us who launch and that's it. It's a pretty small, small thing. But if there was a, a camp or like a safari, um, I know they brought the tow plane to like into the Owens Valley to Lone Pine and had like tows during the week. So anyway, it's been arranged before. Could be a fun thing. What's the name of the club there? Uh, Sierra Soaring Club. Out of out of Inyo Kern. But the other places to come is like, is fly out of Bishop. You know, Bishop is a classic soaring site. There's no tow plane there these days. But uh, some safaris will bring a tow plane for a week and then fly out of there. And my, let me just tell you this, my first cross country experience was meeting up with the guys from Air Sailing, I think, and also from uh, the Pacific Soaring Association. They had a safari at Bishop. 
I joined them and I didn't know what I was doing. And the, the thermals there are so strong that once I got the hang of it, and there's land out sites all along the Owens Valley. So it's, if it's a pretty, you know, it's a very reasonable place to soar. You're not out in, you know, with tiger country out in the middle of Nevada. So the Owens Valley is a, is a good place to soar where you have land outs. Um, and for a beginning cross country student, there can be, you can get a lot of experience there. I mean, the, some people who are more experienced than me would probably say that the whites are, have some real hazards. People have been killed on the whites due to the, the thermals being so strong that you can get rolled into the mountains and stuff. So you have to fly there pretty carefully. But uh, some of the other places around there, I was able to learn quickly how to do some cross country soaring there. And that was a big step for me. That, it, that gave me a lot of confidence. Mm. So Bishop, Bishop's a great spot to soar from. Class yeah, like about a 14 hour drive from here. So it's a pretty big, it's a big safari. The big safari. But um, well, one day I'll go down there and check it out. <laughs> yeah. One of my dreams is to take off from Inukern and soar up to Minden, spend the night there, and then next day soar back to Inukern. One of my one of my friends in the rounds has done that. That sounds like a really fun fun day, a fun couple of days. All right. Well, thanks for sharing all that, man. That's uh... very much. yeah, it's fun, right? Yeah. Happy to share. And like I said, I'm trying to put up everything I can think of up on the internet. Uh, so if you guys need uh, any info or parts or whatever, just shoot me an email and I'll just put it up there so other people have it too. Okay. Uh, are we the only club so far to ask you to speak? No, there's uh, the guys from um, Boulder are want some info as well. And today I got uh, a, a ping from a guy in uh, Switzerland who happened to see the, the wave site and has been thinking about what to, what to use for oxygen regulators and things like that. So it's starting to get some hits. It would be fun to have a place where a lot of information is all gathered. You know, there just isn't much. And um, I mean, like, like stupid things that just cost me so much time, like to find the various connectors, the part numbers are just obscure. If you're in the military, you probably have them laying around, but if you're not, anyway, so it'd be nice to have all this stuff in one place. How about your toes? What did you <laughs> wear? When you, like, did they get cold? You know, my feet did get cold, but not terrible. And I think I, I think I, some shoe, uh, some sole warmers would have been really appreciated, but they weren't so cold that I was distracted by them. Like they weren't, it wasn't bitter and my toes weren't freezing. They were just cold. Um, well, the three, well, that, that window. DG, yeah, that DG's got that nice long window on it. Probably helped a little bit, huh? Yeah, I'm sure it did. I'm sure it did. Um, and those black, uh, those black little wave booties uh, that have some synthetic insulation that goes around your shoes. So the, the actual flight suit I wore, I just got off eBay because I liked it because it had all these pockets. You know, it's just a military flight suit. But I think, a, you know, a mountaineering suit or a, a snowmobile suit also might be quite good. Something you, you, you don't have a lot of wind over you. So something just really fluffy, a lot of down is, uh, is ideal. So, yeah, I was actually, I was surprised I was warm. I, my fingertips would get cold as soon as they were exposed. Um, I have these mittens that open up, right? Just have a little, a little thing on the, and as soon as my fingertips were exposed, holy shit, that was cold air. But, um, but other than that, I was relatively fine. I was so, kind of surprised. Um, but on the way down, I was just terribly cold. I mean, it just like full body shivers. Full body hold, you're holding on to the stick, just like freezing your ass off, trying to get back down to a safe altitude. Yeah. Very exciting. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. It was fun. I, the guys down on the ground gave me a lot of slaps on the back for that. It was a good thing. So it was a lot of fun. Well, as soon as we uh, saw it on, or Ty saw it on Facebook, we were like, get a hold of him. Let's see. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Who's this lunatic? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think, I mean, like I said, you know, I, I like adventure. I like, I like solving technical stuff. And if you can do something amazing by doing that, that's great. 
And I, I do feel like if I had the oxygen, I would have touched, I would have gone ahead and touched 40 and come back down. Um, I feel like that is a reasonably, if everything's working correctly, I feel like that's reasonable. But when you start hearing other numbers that people have gotten to, like Paul Bickles getting to, he got to 46,000, which was a record for a long time. And then uh, uh, Bob Harris at 49,000. Those are, those are altitudes where you can't keep your brain oxygenated. That, that doesn't sound reasonable anymore. So, you know, as fun as it is to try to push the limits, I think they went beyond where it's, it's relatively safe. <clears throat> but I think, 40, I think 40 is definitely a doable, a doable, a reasonably, if the equipment's working correctly, I think you can keep your body safe. Yeah. Other issues were the bends. I don't know if you guys have read about that. Um, the nitrogen coming out of your body. Some people suggest breathing pure oxygen for an hour, half an hour before the flight. I was checking to see whether my joints were feeling bad or any sort of like skin crawling issues. I didn't feel anything. Um, yeah. So. Cool. All right. Thank you. Like, like they say, thank that, you very much. That's been podcast. <laughs> That was fun. <laughs> okay, thanks guys. It's really fun to chat with you. I hope to meet you in person someday. Absolutely. Sounds great. Thanks, thanks Keith. Thanks, Keith. Okay, absolutely. Bye bye. Bye. Take care. Bye bye.